Hello, welcome to the Dividend Cafe Investment Committee podcast. Our whole group back together uh, in person. Okay, when is the last time we did it? It has to have been Feb- February? Because we didn't do this together in March. Oh, together? No. We did We did uh, one together in March by phone, and, we did, assume, and yeah. we did the mm-hmm. Zoom one in April. May, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we've done a couple together remotely, <laughs> but I don't think we've been sitting here together since February. That sounds right. Yeah. Because early March, I don't think we did this. I was in New York that one week, and so here we are. Of course, we've all been talking every day. Uh, I would guess that our – Electronic communications uh, oh, throughout the quarantine period were up about five times from normal on a day-to-day basis of our texting and emailing and our various things. But, um, but you know, just sitting down here together doing our podcast, I know it's what our listeners desperately want <laughs> is for us to be back here to share the good news. Uh, so, yeah, we, um, we have a lot to get caught up on. I actually don't want to spend our time – Really, just focus on the obvious thing of how the market was way down, and then the market went way up. And we've I've been talking about it every day in our COVID and markets dot com. We addressed what was going on in market recovery in our last podcast and some of the particular themes that we that we had uh, through the period. I think that the subject of why markets would have gone up, despite the fact that the economic recovery is you know still playing out and it's not you know rosy out there has been really well addressed. Um, uh, Obviously, there's things that will come up that will be related to that. But particularly, there's a theme going on right now in the markets that I want us to talk about here today. And it has to do with this uh, so-called rotation story. The idea that, yes, markets have gone up, but maybe either what is going up is rotating, changing, like before it was X and now it is Y, and we'll talk about what these variables could be. And then talk about whether or not that rotation story is something that is actionable going forward. Do we want to look to small cap more than large cap or value more than growth or a certain sector more than the technology sector? Things like that. Are there various things rotating in the markets that represent something actionable to us? And and uh, I guess you know the fact of the matter is there does seem to be some changing of what's leading the market in this rally. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actionable. So that's what we're going to kind of unpack and share our own views on and so forth. I'll start with you, Brian. Is there a real rotation going on or is this a sort of technical, transitory, just a week, week or two-week change? Or is this something more uh, paradigmatic? Ro- rotation between uh... – Let's start with that so-called growth in value mm-hmm. because I think that's the one that would be most profound. Certainly – the distinct the delta between growth as a leader and value as a laggard is as significant as it's been going back to before the technology right. um, bust when when I was entering the business. So that's the one that I think is most media sensitive and perhaps most uh, of interest to clients. But yeah, we should we'll unpack those other categories as well. Yeah, <clears throat> no, I mean I think that's a good point to define what we're talking about. So we we, we look at just the index, so like the Russell 1000 growth index versus value. Um, there has been a rotation, and um, is it long lasting and durable? Uh, time will tell. You know the, that that rotation tends to happen because value names tend to be more cyclical, and so if we're actually entering an expansion and, and some accelerating economic activity, then I would say it is durable and it would would be lasting. And you know the other thing I think you had in, in Dividend Cafe last week was just the relative outperformance of growth over the last 20 years. It's never been this high since 2000. And so it's not about, um, you know, well, that is that going to change forever or not? It's more about, is that really sustainable? Is it sustainable to have a 30 year uh, outperformance of a growth index at six and a half time, uh, six and a half percent above the value index? It's not, it's not normal for that to happen. And so, yeah, I, I do think that there'll be a rotation. I think it will be long lasting, I, but I think it is will... this the rotation. Is it happening now? Yeah, I think, I think it's starting to happen now, but you know, I'm not going to say it is going to go in a straight line or anything like that. But I think if you look at the yield curve steepening, you look at economic activity tomorrow being a little bit better than it is today because everything's shut down and it's going to reopen. Um, that should bode well for more cyclical type of names. And those tend to reside in that value index. Okay. Um, I guess, Julian, from the vantage point of the dividend growth equity you had up research on is irrelevant to us. I mean, in other words, are we agnostic about growth versus value 
for any name. And so does this, the, the to Brian's point, it's the Russell 1000 growth, Russell 1000 value, how we're defining it. Are those definitions kind of impertinent to our worldview anyway? I would say yes and no, I guess, because it's, it, uh, it depends. I mean, our horizon is pretty long term. And the more long term you look at, at, at this, the less relevant it is to look at probably at value uh, against growth at performing. So these are kind can, can of like big moves in a, in a shorter term if you look at, you know, a year or six months. But if you look over like a 10 year investment horizon, I guess at the end of the day, uh, we start from it's a bottom up approach and we pick the stocks. But is that true that the growth versus value story, if we believed in it, which w- yeah. you were about, you're making the point we're bottom up, so we, yeah. it's not our approach. But if you were top down looking at that, I don't think it's been six month or one year stories, right? I mean, after at going into dot com, the growth versus value outperformance was at least five years. Coming out of dot com, the value outperformance or growth was at least eight years, and then really ever since, particularly with Fang's ascent 2013 or so. It's been longer term in that sense, right? Yeah, that's right. It's been longer, longer trends. I, I guess so. I think we build portfolios for even longer term than yeah. you know, right. more than like the next five years. I would say it's like we we do for the next twenty years. So, and then it's probably I'm gonna like, have grandkids someday. I'm, <laughs> I got a seventy year timeline for my. So the, the impact on the on the longer even horizon is probably less. Uh, but uh, I and I'm I when I think about you know, change of, uh, you know, value at performing growth. I'm wondering if that's going to be the case when you are still in an environment with money being very cheap and you're able to fund all these new technologies, uh, you know, people are throwing money at them and they're dis- disturbing the existing businesses and they're able to, to stay, you know, in business 10 years, to, you know, without making any money. So, you know, that's a you know, reason why you could think that gr- growth could continue to, uh, to outperform value because they, mm-hmm. ke- they can keep funding themselves very cheaply. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just hop in and just say, you know, we're not index investors uh, ourselves. And so when we're talking about some of these things in these, unique, yeah. you know, changes, I mean, we're buying stocks based on they have both growth characteristics and also they're value oriented because they tend to be dividend payers and things. But um, so, you know, I mean, I think it matters. And it it kind of does. Yeah, that, but, that's, that's, but I want to unpack some Julian said, because I'm not sure if I agree that. Um, the reason for gross outperformance has been a result of, of uh, low rates. I think it's a really... Um, acceptable, like first thought, right? That it makes sense. Low cost of funding, you you can kind of uh, experiment more and put and have some bad situations that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get through. But ultimately, is it true? Like with the fangs, it, was the low cost of capital really relevant to their violent outperformance? Um, we can't say we're not to make this yeah. simpler for our our compliance people. We're not going to get into stock names, but when you look at the largest e-commerce company in world history, for example, when you look at streaming on a VC basis, private equity basis, some of the early funding things, does it maybe allocate capital? Well, we know it does, you're, of course. But when you get into mature indexing, is the low PE the significant driver? I'm not. I'm not sure. No, I mean, I think if the risk-free rate is lower, you can argue for a higher multiple on growth names. You could, you know, but you're but talking, on all you're, names, you're not talking about twenty or thirty times earnings for a lot of the names you're talking about. You're talking about yeah. fifty, mm-hmm. sixty, eight, a hundred times. So I don't think it's that relevant. But what's your take, Dan? Right. So uh, I think the the low rates. Uh, I think it's it's two dim- two dimensional the way you look at how it affects uh, growth names. Number one, like Julian said, uh, growth names tend to. Uh, reinvest more. They tend to be uh, negative free cash flow. They're focused on top line revenue growth. Uh, so it's more a story about them uh, needing to invest large amounts of capital. And if that's cheap, I think uh, that helps them grow that top line that their investors like. And number two, uh, as Brian alluded to, uh, if you're doing a, a discounted cash flow model, which uh, it, you know you project out the cash flows of a company and you apply uh, you apply a certain discount rate to that. And bring those cash flows to present value. Growth names tend to be very, very sensitive to uh, the discount rate. So if, if if you're in a secularly declining interest rate environment, just from a cash flow duration perspective, that tends to disproportionately affect growth names. Um, so that that I mean, it's hard to say exactly what the factors are that have contributed to the outperformance of growth. But by the way, that would argue for the movement down of a discount rate Mm -hmm. impacting growth, not just the mere existence of a low discount. Yes, exactly. In other words, that benefit would wash out. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so the trending down of the, uh, of the discount rate has significantly helped 
growth names just from a, an a, a arithmetic perspective. And, uh, you, you know, as Brian was talking about, some of the, the growth at performance over the last 10 years, uh, it's been, uh, you know, over, over uh, 500, almost 600 basis points. And, uh, I, and I also think it's really important to, to talk about the definition, the classification. What's widely quoted out there on the street and in the media as far as what's growth, what determines growth and value is just a simple factor and it tends to be price to book. And uh, I mean, that's an overly simplistic and uh, you can argue a very flawed measurement, uh, but you have to really understand what, what uh, is being talked about when people throw stocks into a growth bucket or a value bucket. I mean, we consider value as essentially, uh, uh, you know, where the intrinsic value is, uh, is more than when, what the price of the company is being traded at. But the marketplace and what's reported out in the media is just uh, essentially a company that has low price to book, and those aren't necessarily the same things. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that classification is really, is really important. And, and just to follow up on that, I think uh, a big difference as well is that if you look at the balance sheet these days, the companies that are m much more like technology driven, they look very different. They, they are asset light. A lot of the value is in the uh, IP, mm. uh, in the R&D, and these are not uh, you know necessarily um, um, the um, items that go on the balance sheet, but a lot of, of them go on the mm -hmm. uh, PNL directly. So, um, if you look at it from a price to book value point of view, it's, uh, it's very uh, company like tech companies look very uh, different. Yes, yes, right, exactly. Yeah. Well, Robert, is your take that this distinction in this whole conversation is sort of silly, or is it that? Or do you think that there is relevance? Not not just even for us, because as Julian said. Our methodology is bottom up. We're looking at companies that have a long term story of growing free cash flow and distribution thereof. But does it should the media even be talking about it? I mean, does it even matter to that kind of, you know, mom and pop investor at home who's not a client of bonds? I don't I don't think the media knows any better but to talk about it that way. And, you know, for better or worse, the way that we look at the world, the dividend growth investing, it tends to overlap more with, you know, value names than it does with growth names. So yep. we sometimes find ourselves talking about both categories a little bit. Regarding the dividend growth and, and the rotation, I mean, we started to see a rotation to value, let's say, last year, right? When, when we were talking, you know, treasury yields were getting lower, people were saying, hey, you know, what are we going to do for, for yield and income? I mean, that, that story exists now to a greater degree than it did then, right? Um, I think a little bit- But that as, the, as that zero bound has come in in the last few months, mm -hmm. and as all the um, uh, uh, extra accommodation monetary policy has come in, utilities have been worst performer- highest yielding sector, right? So it isn't so much a yield grab yet. I, and I think there's a reason for that too. And I, I, this is more anecdotal than anything. I mean, as, as prices collapsed through this whole, you know, crisis, what have you, people, people were scooping up a lot of different names, even within the growth set categories as well. So there was, there was a lot of buying across the board. So I think that kind of yeah. put a little bit of a pause on what we perhaps saw as a rotation into the value or the dividend growth names. But I think, I think that will continue. I think a lot of the utility underperformance, relatively speaking, could perhaps be attributable to that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. I think that um, there's a sense in which is self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. The the media talks about this for the same reason it's not relevant to investors, and that is that it's all part and parcel of a sort of so not celebrity but sensationalistic. Um, it, it, it grabs a headline. It, it has a, a certain like kind of a sex appeal to it. You know, dot com was very much that way. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, during dot com, and particularly in the year two thousand, let's go back to calendar year two thousand. I, I think you guys all know the answer, and you're really going to know now because I wouldn't be asking if it wasn't an obvious trick question. But when the Nasdaq dropped seventy percent in two thousand, was the Dow up or down that year, that calendar year two thousand? Down. No. Wow. Yeah. Even. Dow was up. What percent or two? No. Pretty pretty significantly. Yeah. And the value, quote unquote, index was up double digits. Yeah. Well, that was that was when value at that point started to really outperform. Two thousand to basically the bottom of the mm -hmm. of the. Uh, but uh, my point, yeah. my point was it was a it was a violent reversal, and I don't have any reason to believe we'll have a violent reversal now. I don't have reason to think we wouldn't. It's financials. The, but see, that's that's a very very good point. Is that you had a higher interest rate environment, right? Dot com didn't blow up because rates came up then, right? It was. And yet the financials performed very well in that rate environment. We had different things going on with housing. You know, that was sort of the beginning of a housing bubble. The mortgage world was totally changing in 2000. Um, and, and really the economy wasn't bad. You just had a bubble burst. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think a lot of this subject as to what will happen, it really depends on what the reason for growth coming down is. 
right now the bubble hasn't burst as you had an entire systemic COVID moment. If anything, the high valuation thing and high growth tech outperformed. Yeah. But at some point when 110 PEs go to 50 PEs, does that money go into value? I think it probably would. Yeah, I think so too. I think that this this pandemic is very unique. I mean, so was dot com, like you said, just massive bubble in technology essentially. But this downturn, it was a health pandemic, and, and the company, the sector that was sort of insulated from loss of revenues and things, happened to be technology as well. So they sort of had, you know, kind of a double benefit, I guess, in that growth sector. Where you know, and, and as we kind of come through the end of it again, it's back to. Where are we in the economic cycle? Are we contracting? Are we expanding? We were contracting, and now we're starting to expand potentially. That should bode well for companies tied to more cyclical, you know, earnings. So I wonder, Julian, if and you remember two thousand. I wonder if there's a distinction with this growth tech. Let's not call it a bubble, but let's just call it a very high valuation period versus two thousand. In that, even if I think these names are very frothy and expensive and so forth, and have a longer expected rate of re- a lower expected rate of return in the future because of their starting point now, they are big names. They are profitable names. Two thousand. That was the most indiscriminate nonsense in world history. No one was distinguishing between the biggest e-commerce player in the world and their buddies dot com that they started in their basement. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where I got we talked about this earlier podcast. Last year, retail investors said no to WeWork. They've said no to certain IPOs. You've had a lot of really challenging rejected IPOs about big rideshare companies and things like that. <laughs> Are we maybe just a more discriminating retail investor now than we were 20 years ago? Yeah, uh, it's clearly not the same. Uh, the tech sector today you can compare to what happened in in 2000. You know, valuations were crazy, and as you, I mean, you could compare it to maybe the bitcoins of like two years ago, where anything you know, like uh, there's some name they just start saying, okay, we're going to mine bitcoin, and then the valuation goes up by 300 percent the next day. Yeah. So it's, that's it's, like I remember like anything that is kind of internet related going public would have crazy valuation right away. Um, so now the difference is the, some of these, te- I mean, these tech companies, they, they make uh, 20% of the S and P profits. I mean, they make, you know, and the, you, you see headlines that say, well, the top five, you know, companies in S and P make more profits than all of the companies of France and Germany combined and which, and it's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. the reality. So it says a lot you, about France and Germany. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it's important so, too to, to break out those, those big names too, because they do constitute such a large portion of, you know, the yeah. S and P and what have you. And, no question, there's some real innovation going on there. There's profitability and what have you. But there's also a market share concern down the road, too. I mean, how, how big and how successful can you get without people wanting to jump in? We've seen it on the e-commerce side. And a regulatory side. concern. And regulatory yeah, certainly. Regulatory. Come, and that's that's bipartisan, too. Yeah. You know, um, But I, I don't know. I, I see still quite a bit of the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out, going on. I mean, we saw recently you know, a, a coffee company that was fraudulent, right? That it, was, it was foreign, right? But people were just jumping into this kind of thing. We saw it with you know, confused ticker symbols for a couple of different companies yeah. leading up to this thing. I think it's still very real. And I, I, I think the indexification of, of the markets has contributed to that largely. But, you know, I, th- I think the value thing will come into play. You, it's like the fool me once, fool me twice type of deal. I think people will get sick of, of losing, losing money eventually. So what would be, um, when you look at the different categories of potential rotation right now, what would be one that is a bit more of interest to uh, us? Um, let's switch gears to the large cap, small cap arena. This is an interesting subject. Small cap was pummeled during the COVID uh, uh, hysteria of March. First of all, um, you had, you know, obviously every market index getting hit. And then within the small cap space, you have something in the range of a third of the Russell 2000 companies that don't generate profit. Mm -hmm. So if you don't generate profit pre-COVID, you really, really don't generate profit when you have no customers or or people had to leave their house and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, now, the argument for small cap in bad periods has always been it's less dependent on global circumstances. It is not um, as suffer as much from when the dollar yeah. rallies, things like that. But um, small cap got killed, and now small cap has begun to catch up to large cap. And I remember being taught in the business that out of recessions, small cap always outperform large cap. That has been true every recession that I've invested through mm-hmm. and every recession I've studied. The reason why I'm hesitant on this is that this recession doesn't feel like a regular recession. Yeah. It was not cyclical. It was event-driven. 
It was um, a, a bottom falling out of the economy and then all of a sudden a quicker move back higher. Regardless of where we end up going in the shape, a big portion of the recovery is clearly going to be direct, uh, very sudden. So I don't know. What do we think here about small cap? Anybody can take the mic. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, as far as uh, small caps, and again, it's uh, it's hard for us, uh, as Julian mentioned, David mentioned, being bottom-up stock breakers to talk about uh, groups of stocks that have some sort of uh, – we're grouping them together based on one characteristic, being that their market cap is below a certain threshold or their mm-hmm. PE is within a certain range or whatever it is. But as far as uh, if we can offer some insight as to what a group of stocks is going to do over uh, over the you know medium to short term, I, I I think it's very hard to do. But uh, to offer some opinions about small cap, I think that uh, it it's, it does appear that there's less uh, there's less uncertainty if you are investing in a name where the revenues are generated primarily in the U.S. Uh, it looks like these this tension between U.S. and China and the moving of supply chains is going to be a, uh, a, a a challenge to capital markets for quite some time. And uh, if you're a, a purely small cap U.S. investor, you insulate yourself from that. Uh, so other than that, I, I'm not sure I have uh, some particular insight, but I, I think that that's, that's going to matter to reduce some uncertainty. Yeah, I, I agree with, with all that. I mean, I think in your first point, it's, you know, we're fundamental bottom-up stock pickers and whether – there's a company that fits below a certain market cap that would, would fit our criteria that we would like to own. I would love to own that company, and we do. Um, the fact that a small cap has now started to outperform a little bit uh, because it's so much underperformed is is great. But would we shift portfolios just because of that phenomenon? No. But um, so, again, I mean, it's just back to bottom-up stock picking. And mm-hmm. sometimes those things most of the time fall in that sort of value category. But sometimes maybe it's more of a GARP, you know, growth at a reasonable price kind of category. Sometimes mid-cap, sometimes small cap. Um, and, and there's different periods of time when all those different subsectors sort of outperform or underperform, but it's not necessarily driving allocation decisions within the portfolio per se. Um, Julian, is the reason for small cap outperforming large cap recently because it underperformed large cap before by nature of the regular old overshooting, overshot on the downside, so it's playing catch up? I was going to say that I think to me the main reason you know if you look at large cap versus small caps and the move, you know, the ad performance and the performance theme. Quite a lot has to do a lot with fear and and um, and greed, and so typically, like human nature, you know, when you have a crisis like COVID, you want to go into what you feel safe owning, and you feel like large cap companies, the big names, you know, that are stable, are going to do better. They have good credit rating, they, they have good balance sheet, they're huge, and they go. They probably they're more diversified, and you know them well, so it's kind of natural to always go back to these large cap, and so that's what happened. And now that you have the reverse, like back to risk on. All the you know emerging markets, small caps going where you feel a bit more risk and more uncomfortable. That's where you're going to find the uh, the alpha, or the alpha performance. I think is very human nature driven. Yeah. So totally. Robert, would you would you recommend that uh, a high risk tolerance investor consider a larger weighting to small cap right now in a, in a tactical sense, or do you think the weighting, the relationship between large and small cap within one's equity portfolio? should be reasonably constant regardless of where we are in the recessionary cycle. You know, whether it's the model or the kind of the tactical approach, I, I think the discussion should be had. I mean, personally, I would I would favor a little bit more uh, allocated towards the small cap space. I think it's uh, it's an appropriately, I don't dare I say, undervalued sector. There's a lot of potential headwinds there, and I think it could be a good opportunity for those that have the, the right risk tolerance or appetite for it. I think it could be good. I think that's an interesting point uh, that even though we are bottom up pickers, it's still helpful to realize, you know, what tends to do what in certain cycles or uh, if, you know, if uh, if growth has outperformed value, uh, you know, what that what that tells us is that maybe there's certain opportunities uh, for selection in value or maybe there's certain opportunities for a selection in small cap. We won't, we won't obviously pick a small cap name just because yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's cyclically. That was my point. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. But if we understand the uh, the nature of uh, how things move in relation to each other in different cycles, yeah. I think it, it helps us where to where to look for certain names. The, the cycle uh-huh. aspect is really interesting that you brought up about how certain things recover coming in or out of cycles. I mean, but this, this – is it is it a business cycle or was this kind of a, a, a mandated show? You know, so yeah, how, how do we point. how do we look at that? It's yeah. so it's so very different, you know. So, 
What I what I suspect, and you guys know that our own strategy in small cap has just outperformed wonderfully, yeah. both in the really good year of 2019 and the really bad year of 2020. But see, I suspect what happens is that in a big sell-off that was so event-driven like that, there's no discrimination. And so the company fundamentals and cash flows become irrelevant. It all sells off together. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden when the when the kind of dust clears and things start to recover – the reality is that well-run companies uh, with more defensive business models just said we got a chance to come back stronger. Yeah. But then I think of it, and now I'm switching categories a little, I do wonder are there some small-cap biotech names, healthcare names, that are tactically relevant in this particular season, M&A opportunities, things like that. It's hard to make investment policy out of that stuff, but, you know, the 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 – pond of opportunity for acquisitions is largely going to be small cap names right Julian? um yeah definitely in, i mean in, we haven't seen too much uh m a uh, i guess typically boards don't feel comfortable doing you know going uh, you know uh, doing an acquisition and opening the yeah, yeah the, the, writing a check in this environment but you're starting to hear you know people talking um and i wouldn't be surprised if you know in the next uh six months you start seeing quite a much more m a once interest rates are staying at zero yeah. even now the economy is reopened yeah. interest rates are staying at zero there's an awful lot of liquidity sloshing around, mm-hmm. and Elizabeth Warren's not going to be your president. <laughs> and <laughs> so we've seen I think M and A is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but what we've seen, we've seen a lot of refinancing. It's amazing yeah. to see how many yeah. companies, you know, been able, how much they've been able to raise and secure, you know, push, you know, uh, yeah. uh, expand maturities, uh, lower the rate, mm-hmm. and you know, just beef up their liquidity and to be able to uh, trillion fund. dollars of high grade corporate debt refinanced yeah. Yeah. more advantageously, improve balance sheets, and and lower cost of capital. So what happens generally next, M and A? Yeah, or buybacks. Or well, that's <laughs> not gonna happen. But that's not gonna happen. Yeah. The 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 pressure on buybacks right now is why I'm more bullish on M and A. Because these guys can't do sit do nothing with their balance sheet. They have to do something. That's a great Well point. they can yeah, also pay more point. dividends. No, no, we'll take that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's yeah. a given. But I think that to the extent that our corporate treasures that are not as dividend friendly as we want them all to be. They're still deal junkies. And and by the way, I don't even say this pejoratively. There is M&A that should be done. There are small cap R&D operators that some of the big uh, cap pharma and biotechs right now can buy on the cheap and and be rewarded for buying it. That's mm-hmm. that's my take. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you'll see M&A uh, M&A pick up for those reasons too. Uh, and and as like you mentioned about the cycle, I, I agree. I I don't think this has been a regular economic cycle at all. And it's just uh, it, as far as market movement, it it may uh, well it doesn't even look like that because it's been such a short term reversal. So uh, if you're looking at the this uh, this type of downturn purely from an economic cycle perspective, I think I think you got to be careful because it'll lead you to. Uh, a, pretty inaccurate conclusions. I completely agree. And I think all of those reasons that we talked about, low interest rates at zero and all of the money that's been put into the system, both from the Federal Reserve and what they've done, the extraordinary measures they've taken and on the on the fiscal side is why you're seeing the market doing yeah. what it's doing. And I wouldn't get in front, I would, I would, wouldn't get in the way of it. You know, as they say, don't fight the Fed and, and that liquidity is what's driving some of these asset prices. And you're right, it wasn't an organic mm-hmm. recession from a, you know, from from those reasons. It was self self-imposed. Now, so here's here's that's a really good segue to the third category of rotation that I want to bring up, which would be the so-called um, cyclicals versus defensives. Mm-hmm. And that line of reasoning would lead one to believe you would want less defensive and more mm-hmm. cyclicals mm-hmm. because it's full steam ahead, Fed, um, all those types of things. Yet we took a more barbell approach. Mm-hmm. We we wanted really high quality defensives to anchor a portfolio. And we wanted opportunistic uh, cyclicals where we thought that they were r- mispriced. Um, is it either or? It, it, should it ever be either or? And that's, to me, the mistake I think the media makes in this narrative. And a lot of asset allocators, too. I hear guys on TV, and you assume somebody's paying them. And it's just mm. the weird this binary approach, cyclicals versus defensives, strikes me as a really good way to blow somebody up. Uh, you, Julian, why don't you take this first, and we'll go around the circle um, is this binary? And if it isn't, does the both and nature of it require some tactical consideration? 
Yeah, if you really go one way or another, that means you're making a big call into where you think you are in the business cycle. And I don't think, you know, it's, it's something that's really predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, you think that we've been calling the recession, like people have been calling recession for how many years? And, you know, it finally came, but was it even a real recession? It's just a self-inflicted black swan event. You didn't hear a lot of the perma bears that four years ago predicting we were going to have a recession because of a self-induced quarantine? And <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I did, yeah, I must have missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's like, it's really hard to predict what the business is going to be like. I mean, it's like, it looks like they're getting longer, they're getting longer and longer. In Australia, they haven't had the recession in 20 years. So I think the idea is you want to have some Thing well balanced with def, uh, you know both cyclicals and and defensive uh, basically and then you can try to you know on the margin decide sure. okay maybe this is a time where we think we're you know closer to the you know end of expansion yeah. period and want to have more defensive but it's really hard to to call these things. I think it's all about valuations of those two things too. Yeah. I mean, you, you find more value and cyclical, cyclical names are more beaten up and, and the intrinsic business is good and you want to own them. And if those defensive sectors are more expensive and, and you know, maybe you would be trimming them. So like to your point, I think it's about tilting, but I don't think it's necessarily what you're seeing on television, which is, you know, you're, you're dumb if you don't have all of your money in these technology yeah. companies in this period of time, or you're dumb if you're not now going all into cyclicals, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Well, like you would say, David, probably about, you know, the analogy to football, you want the defense and the, mm -hmm. the offense, the cyclicals for offense, defense, defensive name for defense. And, you know, and now when you, were you yeah. meaning football as an American football American there? Football, or yeah. so, Okay. Cause <laughs> it worked, it works both ways in that sense. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Robert, I'm kind of leading the witness here a little bit, but yeah. let me ask you a question. Um, do we care about quote unquote outperforming an index? Is that a driver of our financial goals for clients? It's, it's not. It's and so is yeah. the cyclicals versus defensives really a byproduct of this quote unquote outperformance cult? What would make somebody care about overweighting cyclicals here and underweighting here if they weren't playing this nonsensical game of outperformance? It's, you know, it's a keeping up with the Joneses yeah. type of thing. And just regarding the cyclicals defensive, I mean, some of the more cyclical types of things can be extremely defensive. Look at, I mean, the defense sector, so to speak. I mean, that's, that's dependent upon factors beyond just a market cycle. It's government revenues, things like that. And then even within, you know, specific, that's why we love bottom up. I mean, look at the financials. I mean, a company could be very dependent upon net interest margin for revenues versus one that's fee dependent. Yeah. So I think it's, I, I think even more so than growth versus value, the cyclical defensive can be very irrelevant in yeah. practical applications. We also ran so, into, a, we ran into a situation too, again, not going into names, but you guys will know some of them where we looked at it and said, here's a cyclical story that's really strong, really well priced. Oh, but there's some China exposure we don't like. Mm -hmm. So you had to look to an extrinsic factor mm -hmm. that may or may not have been relevant. Might I call that real value investing? <laughs> I, I you know, think so. Yeah. Uh, certainly fundamentalist, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Dale, all that to say, at the end of the day, is a person who is just sort of being organic in the way they approach bottom-up selection, and they're going to end up with a portfolio that has cyclical versus defensive mm -hmm. weightings. But is that investor very likely to have a period where they outperform and a period where they underperform, and that's just the way it's going to be? Uh, ab absolutely, I think that it's very it's very hard to uh, to say from period to period what's going to outperform what. But it comes down to something uh, that the Robert said, uh, which is extremely important: is is that real value investing? And real value investing is is trying to get an understanding of the long term earnings power of a business relative to what the uh, stock is trading at currently and right under understanding why maybe there's a gap in that uh, you know intrinsic value versus what what that stock is trading at so I think that uh, if you approach value as a as a philosophy more than value as a as a factor uh, I think that's a uh, uh, that that is real investing work uh, in our in our opinion and it's not investing based on a formula or a measurement or anything like that and that's uh, investing for the for the long term so, well, I, I agree, and I and I think that when you guys go back to where we were in late March and we kind of reallocated some things in the equity portfolio, um, I, I believe that there were names that would be considered cyclical that we added to at really low prices. There would be names that we considered defensive that we added to. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that that was ever done out of a call on, well, cyclicals are going to lead or, or defensives are going to lead. I think it was done out of total agnosticism about that question but a high conviction that you needed defensives and low beta and high quality balance sheets if the COVID moment had lasted another three months, if markets were going to stay down all the way through the fall, you would have wanted a lot more of those lower beta names. As it turned out, they did reduce a lot of volatility. And by the way, it isn't like they've performed badly in the recovery. No. 
some are at all time highs and so forth. It's just that you got a lot more juice in recovery from some of the higher beta names. And I think you look to some of the alternative asset managers that we added and, and even the banks. Mm-hmm. But that's the interesting thing. Banks cyclical or defensive. They're pri- they're cyclical names. You know, mm-hmm. there's been periods where they were considered more defensive, more boring balance sheet value plays. I think all this vocabulary mm-hmm. stuff is really messed up. Not just in the COVID moment. I think it's been distorted for years. Yeah, decades. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it reminds me of the way things were described when we were first in the business. You know, it was like the late '90s, early yeah. 2000s. Everything was yeah. style box. It was value growth, yeah. small, mid, large, and you kind of set it all up that way in a matrix. But that's not the way we manage money, and it, it, nor have we ever. Um, and so, just it's just not pertinent. But I, I still think the media, you know, b- yes. people understand it in some Absolutely. sense or think they do, and so it's something to talk about. You know? yeah. Right. Yeah. I think you have to really have to go to the detail of the subsectors and the, and the company's drivers because we, you know, within a sector, even you know, you look at the industrials. You know, you have like the defense that's part of industrial is is very uh, uncyclical compared to uh, you know a civil uh, uh, aerospace, for instance. And that's in the same sector, so it's considered a cyclical sector. But some parts of that sector are not really cyclical. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, and at the end of the day, if you pick the stock that's really doing defense, uh, you're not, you don't really own a cyclical stock. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's an interesting point. Within some of our technology names, and within even some of our financial names, not the asset sure. managers, yeah. but you think some of the big banks, they have business lo- revenue lines that are cyclical, and others that are less so. Yeah. Or even in consumer discretionary, I think we own some that uh, I don't think are cyclical. Really, have you no. seen like in the 2008 uh, depression, there were actually everybody. I was going to them, even though they con- they consider discretionary, they're not. Okay. Yeah, I I have actually um, had our sometimes our our sector allocation cat reporting changed because the world's largest uh, cheeseburger maker with a strong drive through <laughs> franchise, <laughs> I uh, and a clown as their mascot. I don't <laughs> I don't consider. A discretionary name. I think no. it, you have to have it. And, <laughs> it's a staple. And certainly, and certainly, the world's largest uh, d- discount department store, t- the, sure. the, yeah. the brick and mortar retail aspect, uh, um, that that can hardly be considered discretionary when the vast majority of products we bought there are kind of normal, have to have household type items, and not coincidentally, those types of names perform very well out of 08, as, as your point, and so. Yeah, I, I, I guess that there is an argument to be made, but it's more anecdotal. It's not foundational. As dividend growth investors who are fundamentally driven, who are value-oriented, who have to make bottom-up calls, can be right, can be wrong, have to analyze things, you you do have uh, a greater tendency to find names that are going to fit your criteria in certain sectors and spaces than others. But ultimately, I don't know why any – money manager would ever want to limit themselves to just one particular part of the pool. You want to be able to go swim everywhere. And then and then those areas where you do find something that might not normally be a space you're in, you could find a really great opportunity. So it's just this sort of binary approach. Maybe it is media driven. I also think it's largely consultant driven. There there were factors in our business, you know, the mutual fund industry, the retirement plan industry, they benefited a lot from creating categories and boxes. And I'm not, I'm not sure it was really great for investors. Certainly not investors who have financial mm-hmm. goals mm-hmm. Yeah. that think around their financial goals. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from the standpoint of maybe forcing someone that didn't have the wherewithal to really know what they were doing in their 401k and they fit things into a box, I guess the benefit could be that it forced them to diversify a little bit in some way. But um, large scale over time, I think it was a hindrance, not a Help. Yeah, we deal with classification issues constantly. I mean, the way certain things are defined, certain things are classified. Uh, I think it helps with communication as far as, uh, you know, with the general public. Uh, everybody knows these terms because they're thrown around a lot. But oftentimes uh, people define them a little differently and, uh, you know, the nuances are uh, really important. But, uh, you know, often, as David said, we have our own way of classifying things uh, that may not uh, reflect what... Uh, you know what S and P classifications are, or what uh, what uh, you know a certain investment banks classifications are, or whatever it is. So, so I think it's a, the nuances matter, and while classification makes things easy to understand, easy to study, uh, when it comes to actually making decision make or actually picking securities, uh, the nuances matter, and and we and those uh, selections drive less off classifications than maybe uh, uh, most other uh, yeah. style box type investors. That might be a really good summary for things, that we embrace classifications out of simplicity, out of convenience for clients, 
reporting and labeling, but they're not decision drivers. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfectly yeah. said. Yeah. yeah. I like. Wow, you summed that up quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I try to get to, right to the point. Um, <laughs> well, let's uh, let's wrap it up, guys. Uh, maybe just go around the horn, and then I'll I'll close it up. Um, any closing thoughts on this subject, and just maybe your general market uh, approach right now. Uh, pretty pretty crazy time, crazy three or four months. I, I don't think any of us would dare claim we expected markets to come back to this level in this time frame. I do think that we all forecasted some version of a very quick recovery of markets and then a kind of period of grind and, and, and choppiness, flattishness. So maybe comment on where you think we are in that cycle, where you think we're headed, and then I'll wrap us up. Brian, why don't you go, and then we'll sure, go around. Sure. I mean, the one thing I would say is you're, you're right. I, I think it did surprise us a little bit on on just the the swiftness of the recovery, and I'm I'm obviously grateful for it. Um, but I will say that never at one point in all of our conversations, particularly in March, and all the things we were discussing, and all the holdings, and all the analysis that we were doing, there was never a point in which my conviction or any of our conviction was was faltering on that we will get through it in a reasonable period of time. We don't know exactly when. But, you know, those decisions that we made all worked out really well. I think we, we added a lot of value to client accounts. I'm very proud of all that work. And to some degree, is there a part of me that feels vindicated on, on going through that hard period of time and, and holding hands with clients and the whole thing and kind of coming through it? I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll feel a little of that, but there's just no victory lap with it because markets will, will keep you, you know, they will mm -hmm. humble you. Uh, and, uh, and so we're not, we're not completely out of it, but I suspect there's probably more positive in the future than negative. Very good stuff. Julian? Well, it's kind of um, amazing to be here, and um, but I guess we shouldn't be uh, stay cool because who knows you know, how long markets will stay here. And if you look at the un underlying fundamentals, there's like, on the one hand, the economy, you know, it's, uh, is it going to be a V-shape, a swoosh-shape recovery? If, st if we're still quite far away from uh, you know, recovering on, on, from the GDP or on earnings front, uh, that said, uh, you know, we own some of the best companies that are very well managed, strong balance sheet and do business all around the world. So, you know, when they exposed to Asia, they already is back to you know, pretty much business as usual, as, as usual there. So I think the companies we own, I'm not worried about them. They're going to do very well. And, you know, weather the storm, they already weather the storm and mm -hmm. coming out of this, they're going to be even stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's probably more of an issue if you own, you know, like for the mom and pat businesses, but that's not what we own. Um, so now I guess I'm 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 interested to go back to looking at fundamental you know earnings and you know they they're going to start guiding again probably next quarter nice. they're going to be a position to guide again and um, and that'll be uh, quite interesting and then you know we're going to start people even starting to talk about they're not talking so much about covid anymore but not focusing on thinking about the election now the biggest worry seems to be is it going to be a democratic sweep mm -hmm. I don't know why you know that's now <laughs> back to like other topics which is good as well that we are kind of moving away from the COVID thing and back to things that are more traditional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very uh, true. Yeah. My, my kind of observation takeaway is more uh, optimistic. It's um, what this, this period gave us as advisors and I think our clients as, as humans is, is kind of three data points. You look at, you know, how you felt from a risk tolerance perspective at the heights, uh, how you felt during the, the free fall at the, as things were kind of tumbling, and then how you feel coming out of it into what we hope becomes a, a sustained recovery. Um, it, it, that's a more consistent way to grade your appetite for risk. And, and I think those are conversations that we love having now more than ever. Right. And there's nothing that helps you, uh, not get caught up in the mood of the moment, I think, than, uh, than really understanding the names you own. And I think, uh, uh, the, the fundamental work that you do really shines in times, uh, when there's a extreme amounts of fear because you understand the solvency of the company, you understand how they're going to make money in this market and how they're going to be a going concern and why you should continue to be invested in them. And I think that that work really pays off in this environment. So, so all, yeah, all I'll, great I'll comments. No, I mean, it's really re everyone you had a different insight to share that I really agree with. And I think it's very important and I'll, I'll close it up with this. I, I think that to the extent that people right now are wondering how to feel about equities, how to feel about economic recovery, that's fine. I get it. Stocks get a lot of that attention. And I think that you can answer the question how I feel about equities within a range of outcomes that are pretty reliable, that equities could could come lower a few thousand points, they can go higher a bit, retest new highs, uh, that there is risk out later in the year around some political side that was there anyways. If I were a betting man, I'd say companies are still going to be hiding the ball on earnings forecast a bit. And by the time we get ready to say, okay, let's actually look at where Q3 really is, then people are going to say, oh, I'm a little more interested in how they're guiding for Q1 and, and into the future. So the earnings thing has been kind of punted a bit. But what I don't understand is why there'd be a lot of question marks 
out of COVID, about the employment data, the economic recovery, what it means to corporate profits, and there wouldn't be about what in the hell bond investors are going to do. That, to me, is the biggest question in capital markets. I believe that the answer to what's going to happen with equities is the same as what's always happened. There's going to be volatility. There's going to be reversals. There's going to be up, down, and there's a forward-moving uh, trajectory because corporate profits rule the world. I don't think the same thing about bonds. I think it's a paradigmatic shift as to where we're headed. Uh, interest rates are are in a very different predicament than they were a year ago. And uh, the outlook for earnings, uh, excuse me, for interest rates is very different for the next 10 years than it's been for decade upon decade looking backward. So I'm really curious as to how wise and effective capital allocators are going to approach fixed income in the months ahead Maybe even more so than equities. Something to think about. Maybe mm-hmm. I just teed up a new podcast. I, I think so. I Let's think do so. It. That's we might a great have to topic. do that. A ten part series. <laughs> That's all we have today for this our reunion edition here in our studio in Newport Beach, California, of our investment committee of the Bonson Group. Thank you as always for listening. Please direct any questions you have anytime to any one of us. We'd love to help you guide further on some of these things. We'll look forward to come back to you again soon. In the meantime, check out covidandmarkets.com every day and dividendcafe.com every Friday. Thanks for listening.